In the first two videos in this series, we discussed basic concepts, circulation, and the incredible complexity of bone. Let us keep these concepts in the background as we observe on the H&E slide the development of a single long bone. This video series on osteogenesis recapitulates original work by Lent Johnson and Donald Sweet, including photomicrographs from the Armed Forces Institute of Pathology Collection. The series summarizes these concepts as prepared and presented by Dr. Sweet to Canadian residents in a monograph and brilliant lecture for 17 years prior to his passing. We posthumously honor both consummate educators whose model for teaching orthopedic pathology has been replicated in part in the COA basic science course. The musculoskeletal system arises from the middle layer of the embryo, primarily the lateral plate mesoderm, from which develops the peripheral skeleton. The limb buds, proximal and distal, are seen in this six and a half week specimen. These contain the anlaga of the peripheral skeleton. In a limb bud, the sequence of formation of a long bone is shown in this sketch. There is mesenchymal condensation, then development of cartilage models. A bone collar forms, encircling the cartilage, initiating the primary center of ossification in the middle of the bone. Chondrocytes undergo a maturation process, leading to hypertrophy and formation of symmetric growth plates. A similar process, at either end, produces secondary centers of ossification. Two types of bone formation occur. Woven bone formation, externally creating the bone collar, which is the cortex, and chondral bone formation in the medullary space, forming primary trabeculi at mirrored growth plates, creating the metaphyseal trabecular array. In these H&E slides, masses of cells, PRX1+, progenitors from lateral plate mesoderm have proliferated and formed a limb bud, and differentiate into chondroblasts, elaborating immature matrix, becoming the cartilage models, ulna on the left and humerus above. Between the models is the interzone, a cursor of the synovial joint, where there is a condensation of collagen 2A expressing limb bud progenitors at the presumptive joint site. On the periphery of these models, cells are further condensed, becoming the perichondrium, source for cells for outward growth. The reddish areas are as yet undifferentiated. In B, at a higher power and a later point in time, cellular masses at the tip of the humerus will become the triceps tendon insertion, TI. Streaks of primitive muscle are present. What you see in this forming elbow joint applies to any joint. There is a specific timetable for each. For the elbow, the cavity appears at 51 days, and periarticular ossification occurs at 12 weeks. In A, in the interzone, the joint is forming as the joint precursor cells expressing collagen 2A and growth differentiation factor F5 in an environment of pressure, flatten out and adopt a horizontal orientation. They secrete fluid and the joint space appears. The cartilage matrix stains characteristic blue. At the margins of any forming joint, cells differentiate along synovial and fibroblast lines and form in one fell swoop within days all of the other elements of the joint, capsule, ligaments, menisci. Specific markers, hyaluronan and hyaluronan synthase, as well as GDF5, are expressed. Recognize the forming olecranon fossa. The formation of the primary center of ossification occurs in the center of every cartilage model bone, and the timetable is unique for each bone. The following slides demonstrate the complex process in human specimens, which may vary from the models in the literature that are based on small animal experiments. Most publications discussing the formation of the skeleton include the following phrase. Most of the bony skeleton forms by this process that replaces a developmental cartilage template with bone. The following demonstrates that that is not totally the case. Slide A shows a cartilage model just before vascular invasion. The cartilage cells, R, C, on either end are resting, and the adjacent matrix is a uniform blue. Moving toward the center of the model, the cells are in the sequential stages of the growth plate, proliferating, which is P-R-O-L-C-S, hypertrophying, 
HTCCS, and then senescence, apoptosis, and death, SAD. On either side of the middle of the model is red stained woven bone, the bone collar, BC being formed by a thick, multi layered periosteum, P. The intact bone collar on either end begins at the precise level of the hypertrophic cells. The adjacent cartilage matrix calcifies, CALC, CART, during the final stages of senescence and stains a deeper blue, increasingly toward the center. Slide B shows a different specimen. Just after one or more osteoclasts, OCL, have created the nutrient foramen by deleting woven bone. A clast sits in the aperture, creating space for capillary proliferation. Chondroclasts, CCL, have formed from monocytes in the hematopoietic and mesenchymal progenital pool, accompanying the vessels. They have already deleted swaths of the endosteal calcified cartilage, as evidenced by the ragged edges of the cleared spaces. Endothelial proliferation will produce a thin-walled sinusoidal vascular bed that will expand to fill the endosteal space as further clast activity occurs. The essential first step in vascular invasion is the creation of space for endothelial proliferation. Only osteoclasts or chondroclasts can delete calcified matrix. There is no mechanism for a vessel to do this. The osteogenic markers associated with PCO formation include vascular endothelial growth factor, BEGF, which is intimately linked to endothelial proliferation and thus vascular invasion, but also the induction of osteoblasts and osteoclasts and the cascade of markers for each process. For bone formation, forming the bone collar, and also for primary trabecular creation, it is Osterix Runex 2 BMP. And for bone deletion, it is MCSF and RANK, inducing osteoblasts and osteoclasts chondroclasts, respectively. The steps leading to formation of the primary center of ossification are as follows. 1. Formation of the bone collar. It seems that woven bone formation occurs in association with the development of hypertrophic cartilage cells in the growth plate, which express VEGF and or Indian hedgehog. As this occurs on the periphery, perichondrial cells change function and name, becoming osteoblasts. 2. Capillary invasion, which occurs only after clast invasion and creation of the nutrient foramen, NF. The essential first step, as endothelial cells have no mechanism to delete bone or cartilage. A sinusoidal vascular bed is formed, spreading to the metaphysis, with accompanying osteoblast progenitors and monocytes. 3. Creation of the primary trabecular array through the enchondral bone sequence. Internally, massive deletion of calcified cartilage creates a space for the residual cores to become nidi for primary trabecular formation. Thus, two types of bone formation create the primary center of ossification. Membranous or woven bone formation creates the cortex for all cartilage model bones. And chondral bone formation creates the trabecular bone array pre and post birth until the growth plate closes. The following cross sections will make this much more clear. The black line in B shows the level of the cut. In cross section A, the primary center of ossification has this appearance. The bone collar is the cortex C, woven bone applied to the margin of the cartilage model. The source of bone is the thick, multi layered periosteum P, the inner layer of which deposits the osteoid in an emanating sleeve. The primary trabeculi, PT, are surrounded by vessels supporting the process of woven bone deposition on the calcified cartilage cores by osteoblasts that evolve out of MSCs in the perivascular stroma, also called pericytes. Again, this is the picture of enchondral ossification. Over weeks, the central portion of the ossification center changes by clast activity, leaving, in cross-section B, a sparse handful of primary trabeculi, each 
covered by slightly more bone. These select primary trabeculi are surrounded by the vascular sinusoidal network. The mechanism of this change is resorption by clasts and continued new bone application by blasts in a constant dynamic driven by the minimal mechanical forces of fetal motion. We started with the formation of the PCO in the middle of the cartilage model. The cortex began as the bone collar wrapped around the cartilage model, woven bone only for the first three weeks. Change is a constant in bone. Osteocytes, once mature, sense mechanical force and remodel the surrounding bone to achieve the best fit. Bone, Hunter said, has a conscience. Wolf's law, whereby bone is made where it is required and deleted where it's not, is the codification of that conscience. The osteocyte is its embodiment. Bone models, changing shape, and remodels, changing internally throughout life. Slide A shows a cross-section of a human fetal femur at three to four weeks post-formation. There is adjacent skin, subcutaneous tissue, SCT, and primitive muscle, M. We will focus on the cortical bone, which is woven bone with early internal reinforcement, mineralized but weak. Reinforcement is undertaken by infill of the open spaces by lamellar bone formation, or LBF, a much slower process that progressively strengthens the bone. The collagen fabric is laid down in successive layers, each oriented 90 degrees to that preceding. The resulting bone structure is analogous to plywood in the layering effect, but the bone structure is riddled with concentric cones of these cable-like elements, giving it strength. In just two weeks, the bone in specimen B has started this process and shows less space, with the periosteum and bone appearing much more substantive. The muscle is more mature. The cortex at this point is an open mesh, and this picture is quite analogous to the picture at three or four weeks after a fracture. In A, the medullary space is primarily sinusoidal vessels, with smaller areas which appear to be pseudocysts, with no recognizable cyst wall and no evidence of fat. There now is just one primary trabeculum internally, and another that merges with the cortex. With growth, the epiphyseal plate moves away from the PCO, along with the widening metaphysis and the complete trabecular array. In just two weeks in B, the cortex, as described, shows less space and more bone. The periosteum is thick. The endosteum has no primary trabeculi. There is residual cartilage in the cores of the innermost circle of cortex, making them primary trabeculi. There is a sinusoidal vascular field with a pseudocystic region as well. Now, several weeks later, the cortex is more robust, as you can see on the left. Virtually every element is more mature. Muscle, periosteum, and the marrow space, which is one sinusoidal vessel. The skeleton is a structure of constant adaptation. If we analyze the slide on the right, there are two patterns of bone. One outlined in green has many cells with large lacunae and less bone. This is the ghost of the woven bone that was present at three weeks after formation. This became a framework whose open spaces have now filled in with bone that is much more stronger, lamellar bone. These circular areas in B, most marked with an inner purple border, are termed primary osteons. There are several on the slide. They are the key strengthening elements in this bone. Note that there are far fewer osteophytes present in the lamellar bone. No cement line is present, just emerging with the woven bone, which has many osteocytes present by comparison. The bone then is a mix of woven and lamellar bone and is termed fibrolamellar bone. The skeleton of the fetus and the developing child until one year of age consists of this type of bone. The osteocytes are no different in lamellar bone. There are simply fewer of them. The objective of this video is to give you a rapid run-through of the development of a long bone from cartilage model to the full establishment of the complete bony structure. In so doing, we have reviewed the histologic steps in forming the cartilage model, a very cursory review of the development of joints, the primary center of ossification, and the structure of the diaphyseal cortex to one year. To return to the longitudinal sections in the fetus, in slide A, the stage is later.
longitudinal growth is established by the growth plates GP on either end. Growth in width is from the cortex C, the sleeve of periosteal new bone emerging from the cambium layer CL of the periosteum along the length of the calcified cartilage model, stopping at the level of the hypertrophic chondrocytes HTC on either end. The growth plates, by virtue of cellular proliferation, elaboration of cartilage, and cellular hypertrophy, move away from the center, leaving behind primary trabeculi PT that undergo selective deletion of most and reinforcement of those remaining. In slide B, you can identify, at the time of birth, a digit. The skin, subcutaneous tissue, cartilage, end caps, CEC, marrow space, BM, and cortices, C. Growth plates are present on either end, joint spaces proximally and distally with well-defined synovial recesses, SR. An early tendon sheath, TS, is also seen, present even before the joints are fully developed. The marrow space has a life cycle on its own. It starts out as a fibrovascular reactive tissue involved in the formation of the primary center of ossification. This task done, it becomes populated by deeply basophilic staining hematopoietic tissue. As growth occurs into adulthood, the hematopoietic tissue involutes and is replaced by fat in all but the axial skeleton. The vascular supporting network remains with a sparse perivascular array of stem cells. It is this network that is called into play when imbalance or disease presents throughout life. The radiograph reinforces the concept that only the mineralized portions of the bones are visible. Most epiphyses will develop a secondary center of ossification. In the phalanges, metacarpals, and metatarsals, we only develop a growth plate on one end of the bone. Most of the growth comes from the end of the bone where there is a growth plate. Now, the idea that growth does not occur from the subarticular cartilage is incorrect. A minor amount of growth does occur through the proliferation of cartilage cells in the germinative level of the articular cartilage adjacent to the tide mark. Growth is muted at this site because the cells derive their nutrition by diffusion from the articular space. There is blood supply from the epiphysis which allows bone growth to occur, as opposed to the growth plate which derives supply from both the epiphysis and the metaphysis. The synovial recess you see is deep on one side and shallow on the other. There is periosteum covering the bone adjacent to the recess, but no other soft tissue. Consequently, in a fracture, there will not be the development of extraosseous callus. It is also a site of ready access for panis invasion and rheumatoid arthritis. Eventually, the growth plates close and the sites of their locations are remodeled out, leaving this radiographic appearance with cortex and cellus array supporting the subchondral plate and a joint space whose contents are imagined on the X-ray and are demonstrated on the photomicrograph on the right. If you look between the subchondral plate and the articular cartilage, there is a basophilic or densely blue staining wavy line called the tide mark. The tide mark is the delineation of the junction between the articular cartilage and the underlying subchondral plate and is the watershed between the nutritional supply from the epiphyseal circulation and the zone of diffusion from the articular space. Growth occurs throughout life in the cartilage adjacent to the tide mark slowing down once skeletal development ceases, but continuing at a slower pace from then on. The articular changes that occur in a joint from the development of osteoarthritis arise from alterations in growth from this site. In summary, then, we have done a quick overview of the development of a long bone, discussing limb bud formation, cartilage models, the development of joints with the elbow as an example, the primary center of ossification in detail, because it is where osteogenesis begins, bone collar formation leading to understanding of the cortex up to one year of life. The final video in the series, Osteogenesis 5, will allow you to observe in detail metaphyseal bone structure, further formation of the secondary center of ossification, modeling and remodeling, primary and secondary osteons, and the cortex through adulthood and aging. That's the end of this video.